I don't know. I don't know if it's the end of the world or not. You guys tell me. With the new Moto Proprio Traducionis Custodes, a lot of people are giving these hot takes, you know, that it's the beginning of the end for the Latin Mass and all that stuff. I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I'm going to hopefully amidst these hot takes, give a soak at sake that can give us the right perspective to become saints. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let's jump into it. So what I think that this Moto Proprio does is it really raises a lot of questions. Um, the two that come to mind for me most fundamentally are first, can the Pope abrogate the Tridentine Mass, the traditional Latin Mass, as my current pastor, Father James Jackson, says in his book, Nothing, Superflu Nothing Superfluous, the right of Saint Pope Gregory the Great. Uh, it's been around more or less for about 1,500 years, codified at the Council of Trent in that time. And um, in Summerum Pontificum, the motu proprio from Pope Benedict, that was about 15 years ago, we were told that this Mass had never been abrogated, uh, even after the promulgation of the Novus Ordo Mise. So can the Pope, does he have the authority to do that? So let's go and look at some of the, the um, quotations from prominent sources on this topic just to see how difficult this question is. So um, first, Pope Francis, in this motu proprio, uh, had an accompanying letter and in that, he said, concerning those who are rooted in this previous form of celebration, that they need to, quote, return in due time to the Roman rite promulgated by Saints Paul VI and John Paul II, end quote. So that wasn't in the motu proprio, so it doesn't hold the same weight, but it does show clearly our Holy Father's intentions. It seems to me that, that that means he wants us to return to the Novus Ordo. Anyone who goes to the traditional Mass eventually should all come around to the Novus Ordo. Okay, so that, that seems one, one part of this whole thing. Okay, now concerning the Pope's juridical power, with regard to disciplines in the church, not just infallibility when speaking ex cathedra on particular doctrines or dogmas, such as the Immaculate Conception, but also with regard to disciplines in the church under the jurisdiction, you know, in practical matters. Vatican I in Pastor Eternus says, quote, Wherefore we teach and declare that by divine ordinance, the Roman Church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power over every other church, and that this juri jurisdictional power of the Roman pontiff is both episcopal and immediate. Both clergy and faithful of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience. And this is not only in matters concerning faith and morals, that infallibility thing that I said. But also in those which regard the discipline and government of the church throughout the world. Very strong statement. This is the teaching of the Catholic truth, and no one can depart from it without endangering his faith and salvation. That said... This power of the Supreme Pontiff by no means detracts from the ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops who have succeeded to the place of the apostles by appointment of the Holy Spirit tend and govern individually the particular flocks which have been assigned to them. All right, so that's, that's Vatican I in the 1800s. So what are we going to do with that? Um... Kind of strange situation, because now we have Cardinal Burke, an extremely competent canonist. 
He was the head of the apostolic signatura. Basically the head of the, the church's like court, basically. Okay. He's the head of the law. He was. Okay. He had a statement. You can go to cardinalburke.com and find his statement on Tradiciones Custodes, where he says, on point number 15, quote, But can the Roman pontiff juridically abrogate the UA, the Usus Antiquor, or the traditional Latin Mass? The fullness of power of the Roman pontiff is the power necessary to defend and promote the doctrine and discipline of the church. It is not absolute power, which would include the power to change doctrine, to eradicate a liturgical discipline which has been alive in the church since the time of Pope Gregory the Great and even earlier. The correct interpretation of Article 1 cannot be the denial that the Usus Antiqua, or the traditional at Mass, is an ever-vital expression of the, quote, Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite, end quote. That's what Pope Francis had said in his accompanying letter. Or even in the Moda Propria, I believe. Our Lord who gave the wonderful gift of the Usus Antiquor will not permit it to be eradicated from the life of the church. Okay, so that's what Cardinal Burke says. So we're, we're seeing a juxtaposition here of the Pope has seemingly absolute, no, wait, he does have absolute juridical power. But what, what happens when, you know, an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? That's basically what we're seeing here. Uh, if, if, if that's what the argument is being made, basically, that something that is so immor- immemorial in Catholic tradition is like an immovable object. That's that Cardinal Burke's argument here is basically, it's, it's predicated on the notion that, quote, a liturgical discipline which has been alive in the church since the time of Pope Gregory the Great and even earlier, end quote. So he's making an argument, it's not necessarily apostolic, but kind of it's apostolic, okay? So can the Pope change that? I mean, Seems like this would fall under the jurisdiction of discipline, but maybe not. I mean, Cardinal Burke's saying it's not, and he's not typically one to be that, like, uh, I don't know, edgy, you know. And he's a canonist, so he, he knows this stuff. But it seems like he could do it. I don't, I, I don't understand why he couldn't technically. Um, now that I'm not diving into the questions of, you know, well this is going to be to the detriment for the salvation of souls because one, it's not going to force any of us to commit sins inherently, but two, um, that's a whole can of worms. And then we're getting into a lot more private judgment and things like that, which I would first want to just, you know, cover my bases with anything I can get my hands on that clarifies the public and objective statements of the church before diving into more private judgments of like this is severely dangerous to the salvation of souls because that's going to be a huge can of worms a huge gray area that i would rather just not have to dive into if i could get clarity on this so uh, this is kind of where i i'm 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 at i I don't know the answer to that question Uh, i had a friend post to me the notion like could the pope technically strip the liturgy of all ritual and just have a priest come in and say the words of consecration, and then leave? Like, could he actually just strip the mass down to that? It's still valid, right? I mean, so I don't know the answer to this. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but you have to be able to answer these ridiculous questions. Like, if the Pope has absolute authority, I mean, that's really absolute, if you know what I'm saying. So, I mean, again, Vatican I says, we teach... By divine ordinance, this is clearly like dogmatic. This is at a a council with bishops. It says, wherefore we teach and declare. Boom, right there. You know, this is is it. Rubber meets the road here. Like, this is legit. The jurisdictional power of the Roman Pontic is both Episcopal and immediate. Immediate. It's not just like remote. It's like over anything. Okay? That's why like popes in the past, the the Jesuits order... Side of Jesus could just, poof, gone. Okay, so the Pope can do that. The, both clergy and faithful, of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of hierarchical submission and true obedience. 
And this not only in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in those which regard discipline and government of the church throughout the world. Don't really know how you get around that. Um, maybe it has to, it probably has something to do with like liturgy. Is it just a matter of discipline? I mean, it, it definitely ties into to faith, right? But then, I mean, where do you draw that line and who draws the line? I mean, that's like normally, you know, the buck stops with the Pope. So who's going to draw the line as far as like, okay, once you strip the liturgy down to this much, that's when you can't do it anymore. You know, like my, uh, with regard to what my friend was suggesting, like, can you strip down everything to just the words of consecration? I don't know. Makes me wonder, you know, have, have we had such an emphasis on liturgy that like we're losing sight of something? I don't think that's the case because you know, right now we're so liturgy deprived and we're seeing the fruits that come from reverent liturgy. I mean, that, and we have so much richness that comes from that and how critical, I mean, it's the life of the church. So I don't think we could say we're emphasizing it too much, but I don't know. All right. So practically, what are some of the conclusions of this? And, and I, I'm, I'm saying, I don't know the answers to all this, but these are important questions that are going to have, like this at least hopes... I hope will help situate it for you um, and see like the difficulty that we're facing. So in um, diocese, bishops are now coming out with statements and will a lot of them have kind of postponed. They said, hey, give it three weeks and I'll figure out what we're going to do in the diocese. You know, and I think a lot of them really do care about those who go to the traditional Latin mass and want to look out for their spiritual welfare um, and sympathize with these Seemingly harsh restrictions um, that are coming out for sure. So um, I think maybe the per perhaps the most interesting statement that I've seen so far has come from um, Bishop Paprocki of the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois um, because he just came out with the boom dynamite with Canon 87, Section 1, uh, which states, quote, a diocesan bishop, whenever he judges that a dispensation will contribute to their spiritual good, is able to dispense the faithful from universal and particular disciplinary laws issued for his territory or his subjects by the supreme authority of the church, end quote. So basically, he's using that and saying... Quote, since it will contribute to the spiritual good of the faithful to the extent that it may be needed, a dispensation is granted from Article 3, 2 of Traditionis Custodes, authorizing the use of the 1962 Missal at the parish churches of blah, 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 in Springfield, Illinois. So basically, because what, what, what this motto appropriate, if you need to get caught up on, is that it basically says you can't have the Latin Mass in parochial churches and parishes. Now, in Europe, they have a lot of chapels and stuff, so, you know, you could offer Latin masses at chapels, but in the United States, we basically just have parishes. So, <clears throat> you know, I won't dive into the question of Europe, but a lot of bishops are basically, and what I'm seeing are basically saying, look, for their own good, we don't really have other alternatives, and I, as the apostle of this territory, with jurisdiction, and making the judgment call that it's best just to continue in these parishes. Um, now, this bishop, Bishop Paprocki, is the first, I believe, to cite canon law, canon 87, section 1, that says you can dispense when there's something that's going to contribute to the spiritual good, okay, from universal and particular disciplinary laws. So, like, that's, I mean, this is, this is where things get confusing, because you're saying the the Pope has absolute and immediate jurisdiction, and yet it's up to the judgment of the bishop. Either way, that that's what this bishop has said. Uh, it seems legit. I hope that he is not, I guess you could say, impugned or punished on an ecclesiastical level in any way or in a behind-the-scenes kind of way. We should pray for him for this boldness. Um but I, I don't I don't I'm not a canonist so I don't know but he's that's what he's saying and 
I would hope that that means other bishops can do the same. And so then I guess what it's going to lead to is different dioceses are going to be, you know, you might have a very large difference diocese to diocese, you know, some that are very pro and some that are very anti. Um, I don't know how this is going to shake out, but these are the questions, you know, what, what is the authority of the Pope? And this is really something that ties into the state of the church for the last hundred years is ecclesiology and, you know, levels of magisterium. I mean, we'd often want to go to St. Thomas Aquinas for this kind of stuff, right? But St. Thomas, this wasn't like a major theme in what he was doing. He never, I, I, I recall hearing that that was going to be part of the finality of the Summa Theologiae before he, you know, said it was all dung. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. Either way, we don't have a lot from St. Thomas with regard to all these more, you know, jurisdictional questions. And part of it's because it's really the last few hundred years as we've transitioned more and more to a hostile culture, first relativist, and now it's becoming hostile, but relativist, you know, the revolutions, things like that. There was a lot of emphasis on the power of the church and the power of the Pope. Vatican I really emphasized a lot the power of the Pope, and that's where the infallibility of the Pope was solidified. Okay? That's why Pastor Eternus, I read that, because that's that's the source we're really getting a lot of this from. But at the same time, we're now dealing with a situation where it's ironic because there's a lot of emphasis on collegiality, and yet a lot of the questions, at least from the more orthodox side of things, with things like Amoris Laetitiae and giving the Eucharist to divorce and remarried couples, um, statements on whatever matters that might come up, to what extent is there authority to overturn or not overturn doctrine or overturn critical longstanding practices, but um, if not overturn, just, you know, significantly alter. Um, where is that authority? I, these are the major questions. And, and what I would say, there's a lot of people out there that are giving hot takes and this is the end clearly. And, you know, I'm just going to tell you guys, like, there's a lot of people, they want a lot of clicks. Okay. So that's one thing, but there, there, I would say that this is, you know, talking to a friend, I didn't, I didn't actually think this was going to happen. He did, but, um, you know, usually things are exaggerated, but this one, there is weight to this, like, because there are people who are really going to be concretely impacted as far as their Latin masses either taken away or say those. In, I, I really feel for those who are going through seminary. I know someone, you know, that that had in, intended to be doing the Latin mass. And you know, it's just I really feel for those because they may no longer be able to do that. Now, the flip side of that is, look, I mean, the next pope could do something totally different. This just shows like, okay, this is basically moto proprio, um, like fight of the titans, right? We've got like Summarum Pontificum and then a new, no, Summarum Pontificum versus kind of practices that were not necessarily formalized, but just in practice, there was a, 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 a resentment toward the Latin mass, you could say. And so moto proprio against that. And then, and then now this motu proprio against that motu proprio. Um, so why not just throw another motu proprio in? Like, let's just do some motu proprio kiboshin. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the next pope would do that. Maybe it'd be worse. I don't know. And that's where I want to tie it into now, like more of a perspective on this. Um, there's a lot of questions. And anyone who pretends to absolutely know clearly the answer as far as not what direction should the church go in, but concretely right now, how do we view, especially things with regard to the authority of the Pope and the extent to which we can hold certain traditions, that immovable object as truly immovable. And what are the, what are the bases for that? Such as the salvation of souls. Okay. But then you're diving into private judgment and a lot of prudential matters that, excuse me, are not like necessarily clear with regard to dogmas and doctrine. And for a lot of us, we're like, dude, it's so obvious, you know? 
the difference between like a kumbaya hand holding everyone standing around the table altar table whatever you call it clown mass is incredibly different than like a traditional Latin mass and i'm not and, and that's an exaggeration but even just like a typical you go to a typical parish today we know what it can be like especially if there's guitars or things like that and or drums drums you know or you know hand clapping or who knows what versus when you go to a mass a liturgy this could be novus ordo or traditional that's reverent where a lot of people not all receive kneeling on the tongue where there's silence in the church where there's gregorian chant where there's maybe ad orientum we know the difference there i mean the studies show like 70% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. Hello. <laughs> My friend brought up, you know, okay, there is there are some trads that are uh, that reject Vatican II in its entirety, and I, I think that I would hold a position that says, I understand the concern. Anyone who doesn't see that there's an apparent contradiction with things prior has not read the things prior with on, re, with regard to things like religious liberty, or even how we view Protestants, okay? Um, there, There is seeming contradiction, but at the same time, we can have trust and faith, and we can look at things and see, we can interpret things in different ways and see how it all fits together. That, that would be my position. I understand the seeming contradiction, but I still would say, look, you can't abandon the rock, you can't abandon Peter, you can't abandon the church. It's a dangerous road to go down. Try to do some apologetics with Orthodox, and you might find yourself arguing against yourself. Okay. That said, we're in a predicament here because we got 30% of, only 30% technically really believe in the real presence. And so, yeah, there's going to be trads who, who reject Vatican II and all, but most don't. Most may have complaints, or they may not formally do it they don't they don't really know that's the thing is like it's vatican ii it's like you need to believe in vatican ii most people have no idea what vatican ii is what percent of catholics have actually read you know even a quarter of the documents let alone all of them from vatican ii i mean it's big there's a lot okay and we're not expected to we're, we shouldn't be expected to the vast majority of catholics should not be expected to be experts on vatican ii or even like the new catechism we got that's like this big you know like that's just not realistic to expect all Catholics to, to be able to read all of that, understand it all, grasp it, articulate it. We need to boil, the, that's why we had things like the creed, you know, boil it down to the basics, simplified like this, boom, right there. Okay. Um, so that being the case, you know, those who, who do accept Vatican II are at least accept that the Novus Ordo is valid, the new mass, the quote-unquote ordinary form. They accept that that's valid, so that means they believe <laughs> that there's real presence there. The vast majority of traditional Catholics believe that, that go to Latin Mass in a canonically, um, even, in, even in some that are irregularly, irregular from a canonical standpoint, but those who are canonically regular Catholics, so to speak, uh, accept the validity of, of the Novus Ordo. So there's the real presence there. So the vast majority of traditional Catholics who don't go to the Novus Ordo or who, who, who at least prefer the traditional Mass or go to the traditional Mass more often than they go to the Novus Ordo, they actually believe more in the validity of the Novus Ordo than the majority of Novus, Novus Ordoites because only 30% only of Novus Ordoites believe in the real presence, which, mean, which means the... the the greatest amount of Novus Ordoites, so to speak. And I don't mean to say that pejoratively. I'm just speaking off the cuff here. Only 30, at the, the most amount of Novus Ordo going Catholics that we could possibly have that actually believe in the validity of that Mass is 30%. Let's assume all of those who believe in the real presence believe in the validity of the Mass. So 30%, whereas traditional Catholics probably 95%. Not just of the Latin Mass, but of the Novus Ordo. So that's just an, a little like ironic uh, 
twist there. Um, but anyway, that all is just, uh, you know, I, I found that ironic. But um, it doesn't change the fact that we're dealing with a difficult situation and, and we shouldn't pretend that we have all the answers. And all the clickbaity stuff, you know, they're going to try to tell you they have all the answers and all, but okay, there's going to be some needed, like really fleshed out theological debate and discussion, good sourcing. Um, I know some things might just seem like when you're in person, it's just like, duh, duh, this is better, more beneficial for the salvation of souls or whatever, but, or, or for other people, it might be, duh, we just have to stick with the church and why does it really matter so much with regard to liturgy? Okay, again, two positions I think do seem to make a lot of sense. Now, what do I personally do about that? Um, I don't think the solution is to go watch every all caps exclamation mark YouTube video with someone who looks like this and um, freak the freak out. I don't, I just don't, I don't, I don't see that as a good solution. Okay. Um, and, and from a personal standpoint, as far as what I'm most concerned about, what I first am responsible for is the salvation of my soul. And I know that just getting sucked into all that is not going to be beneficial for the salvation of my soul. It needs to be brought in in a certain balance with everything else. Okay, but freaking the freak out, again, if you can point to somewhere where saints make it clear that that's what you're supposed to do, then please be my guest because that would be a revelation to me. But from everything that I've read on the spiritual life, not that helpful. And that's an understatement. Okay. It's good to be informed, but you can become an addict with this stuff and you can lose peace of soul. So where do we go from here? What is the perspective that we should take from a Soka standpoint. What is the uh, what is Soka's perspective, so to speak, on all this stuff? Well, I'm not going to speak for Soka's perspective. I can say here are principles that Soka lays out that can help give us perspective, and I'll try to maybe extrapolate some of these uh, for my own benefit, and hopefully you may find some benefit as well. Uh, so the first thing I would say with regard to all this is in our spiritual life, and, and this just comes down to anyone who's trying to be effective in their life, is you have to look at your circle of influence. What is within your sphere? What can you control? Now, this isn't to say we should be indifferent about matters such as politics or the church at large. We should be concerned about the common good. So that does matter to me, Right. But most of my energy and time should be channeled so that it goes toward what is in my circle of influence. Okay? Just getting mad and yelling about things is not going to be the best solution. And so when we're looking at these big questions, we should always tie it into, okay, Let's say there's a worst case scenario. Well, that could be kind of scary, but some of the worst cases. Let's say I no longer have access to Latin Mass. Yeah, for some of us that can be a scary thought. Uh, especially if you don't have a reverent Nova Soto nearby. No, I thanks be to God do. Um, now, to what extent does that play a role in my life, right? I need to save my soul. I'm saved through sanctifying grace. I grow in sanctifying grace through the interior life. Have they taken that away from me? No, they've not. And they can't. No one can. Our Lord has given that to you. You know, in Japan, there were... Centuries that went by, I believe, from the time of St. Francis Xavier being there to when they had another priest. 
And they held on to the faith. They still had the faith after, I believe, hundreds of years. Amazing. They passed it on for generation to generation. There's no priests, no sacraments. I mean, they could do baptism, but... Wow. And I'm not saying that's ideal. I'm not saying we should go to this sort of rustic, archaic, antiquarian, go back to just how it was in the apostolic times, you know, without these big churches and structure and all. Because we've developed. We've grown. That's better that we have these beautiful churches for our Lord. That we have these ceremonies and all that. That was intended by the Holy Ghost. But if we were stripped of things, should we freak the freak out? I would say no. And that leads to the next point of, here's what my sphere of influence is. There are things that I really, really, really think are important for my salvation that are given to me from the church, which obviously they are. Confession, sacraments, the liturgy, absolutely. But they can't take away the interior life no matter what. That's in my sphere of influence. But the next point I would say is with regard to the interior life, Gary Goulagrange says that it is critical to develop a spirit of abandonment and trust to our Lord. If you want to be able to maintain a spirit of recollection, you have to be able to abandon yourself and trust in God and not be preoccupied. That doesn't mean you're irresponsible or you don't care. If you don't care, then you're heartless and you need to check yourself. But you do care, and yet you don't lose your peace. Our Lord said, I, I give you my peace. Supernatural peace. So then the third point. Circle of influence, abandonment, sanctity. By and large, what we should be aiming for in terms of our apostolic efforts, because you and I, we, we are called to the mission of the church within our sphere, within what we can do. We should be trying to promote sanctity to the best extent we can. And now I know a lot of us are convinced that reverent liturgy, or the traditional Latin mass, is critical for that. I'm not saying there can't be reverent novisordos, but a lot of us are convinced the importance of things such as ad orientum, reception of the Eucharist, kneeling on the tongue, the old offertory prayers, the canon of the Mass. A lot of these can be found in Nova Sorda if they're actually done. It's just very, very rare that you find one that does all this stuff. And then there's things that even are left over, but we're not going to dive into that. We'll leave that controversy for other times and places, often for other people. Because I'm most concerned about salvation of souls. And I know that that does play a role in it, but... Regardless of what the situation ends up, we are not supposed to give up. We have to play our role. And we still, even if the Latin Mass were abrogated entirely, we still can play a role with regard to promoting formation, promoting sanctity, promoting the interior life, promoting virtue, promoting Catholic culture, promoting traditional family life. Promoting traditions and customs. Gregorian chant. So many other things we can still promote. And so that leads to my first, fourth point from a real Soka perspective. Where can you go to get a standard formation, the essentials and all those points, and then share it with others? How can you learn what the interior life is, the one thing necessary, how to practice it, how to share it, and how it ties into a holistic Catholic outlook and way of living based on the traditions, the wisdom, the saints. Where do you go to get that? A synthesis of it all. Not like one big book on one sliver of a topic or ten books on a minutia of a topic. That's what we're trying to provide in Soko with a master class of formation, a standard of formation. And just think about it. Like, you want to, what, what would be our strategy? Do we have a strategy 
with regard to the state of the church today, with state with regard to the state of the world. A grassroots strategy. We're talking a lot of things top down, and that's really important in the church, but we always have our individual free will and local efforts and things like that, which is critical as well to the movement of the church or the future of the church, where vocation is going to come from, where our bishop's going to come from, all that, from families, family life, local parishes. You can start groups that go through this formation. You can have accountability with one another. You can brainstorm apostolic efforts to influence local politics or to evangelize at the local level or to push certain agendas for the good of the family, to spread certain resources. And then you can get chapters set up and you can have officers. And then you can have, you can grow and anyone who's going to be a part of that that effort will get intense formation so that it's no longer a standard of what we all would complain about, the fluff. I think that's what a lot of people complain about when they don't go, when those who do go to Latin Mass and they, they think it might be taken away, they're like, all I'm going to get is fluff now. I'm going to be surrounded by people who don't really care that much and I'm going to get fluff formation. Well, you don't have to settle for that either way. Okay, we have the, the, the wisdom of the saints at our fingertips. So we've realized it's okay, and we're trying to spread that. So check out our masterclass when we have it. But that, that's why we're doing this masterclass, so we can form leaders like yourself, parents, leaders in parishes, organizations, etc., spread it with their families, and, God willing, organizationally. So you get a chapter set up, and then, and then once you've formed enough people, then you have a small little, you know, nucleus of operatives, in this army, soldiers. I mean, the soldiers, they can do things, you know, your little cohort. Cohort can have little operations. And as you grow, you form more people, you have make bigger and bigger impact. And if you had a thousand people, that's all you need is a thousand. Imagine the impact that you could have. Because everyone else is so lukewarm today. You know? Now you know, that, that also requires, you know, strategic efforts. You have to think it through. Use prudential reasoning. We have to be dedicated. It has to be a culture of dedication. That's why formation is so critical. Formation that is embedded in a language, a message that is all in, that is not fence straddling, that is not watered down. You can complain all you want about things out there, but are you helping to promote this message? You can that's what we're going to help you do it. If you if you want to be a part of that, be a part of the Soka Master Class and membership. And soon we're going to be having chapters. And we'll be able to promote Catholic action. This was a movement that the, the old school popes wanted to promote. The lady being involved in the hierarchical mission of the church, particularly with regard to the temporal mission of the kingship of Christ in society. The church's vision for society. That's another part of this formation that we need is a sense of vision. Being called on to something greater. A greater good, a common good, something to die for. That's the church. That's what the church should be. Most young men don't hear a message of magnanimous, magnanimous calling in the church. Usually you hear that from like Jordan Peterson or Jocko Willink or something like that. That's where they go for inspiration. But I think you and I would agree. Like that's part of the reason why we'd, we'd value ancient liturgy so much, reverent liturgy as a whole, because it's something that inspires us to transcendence, to be all in, to be dedicated. And I think anyone would agree, even if they, that this doesn't really matter to them, the traditional Latin Mass, I think they'd agree, that's that's a good Catholic, we need a culture in the church. This a culture entails language, right? Certain conviction among the people. That entails this all-in mindset. There's something off with this lukewarmness. That's not normal for a central doctrine like the Eucharist to be disbelieved by 70%. That's not normal. Something has to change in the formation. And formation isn't just a matter of knowledge. It's not in formation. It's formation. You have to tie it in with the practical, the speculative with the practical, how you live, how you see things concretely. 
You can learn a lot of things in textbooks. There's a big difference between that and developing the habits and the way of life and the heart and the will and the guts and the grit to live it out. Because you got to persevere through the temptations and the pleasures of this world today and the ideologies and the discouragements, all that. So that's what we're trying to do is develop this masterclass to be able to help you and, and tons of others to become leaders in this, this effort. And I would like some prayers because it's a huge undertaking to try to come up with a synthesis like this. Uh, and we need the help. There's a lot of ups and downs already. And there will be many more. But the more people that are on board with this, this vision, who are convinced, no matter what, I'm going to take my personal responsibility in this mission for the church and how I can with my soul, with my family, with my local area, with the talents that I have. I'm going to get formed. I'm going to live the interior life to the fullest. I'm going to learn from the saints, take on that perspective, an eternal perspective, seeing how short this life really is. You know, we live in such a blimp. A blimp, it's just boop. It's nothing. In the history of the church, but... Even the history of the church is so short in comparison to eternity, right? This is all just a little boop on the radar, on God's radar. And he's intensely, personally connected to each one of us in our very minute details of our life. But still, the grand scheme of things, like, we got to keep perspective here. You're going to die. I'm going to die. From an eternal perspective, it's going to happen really soon. So let's start today preparing for that. And that often kind of hones in our mindset to what's most important. I've been reading this book that I think could give us a lot of perspective right now and at, at all times, but I think it's connected to right now. It's called Man the Saint by Ortega. See that? 95 cents. That's how you know it's, it's real trad. It's that old. This is a chapter... Four, you too can be a soldier. These days, youth is the best time for acquiring sanctity and the time to begin to live an ideal. This is true of all youth in history, but the youth of today have had the good luck to be born in perhaps the most interesting period in the whole history of humanity. The Christian of today lives zealously, and energetically. He is happy to live in such a period. The only thing which frightens him is the humdrumness and mediocrity. Not the humdrum of every day, since every day brings its own problem. His soul knows only one fear, that cowardly vulgarity, which is sin. He hates mediocrity. He hates to do things by halves. He shuns all pessimists, who see only the difficulties of everything, and he is not afraid to live as a Christian in the world among other men. Are you happy to be in this time? Are you thrilled that you get to take part in this war for the salvation of souls? Or are you living as a theoretical Catholic and a practical nihilist with no meaning and purpose? As a pacifist, I'm not a part of this. Not even passive, it's a bystander. Are you a bystander? If you feel like you're a bystander, look up Archbishop Fulton Sheen, bystander. That'll get you motivated. Bystander at the cross. What a despairing outlook on life. I'm just going to kind of coast. I'm going to be mediocre. I'm going to blame everything with pessimism on how bad things are today. I can't do anything about it. Man, it sucks to live in this time. God, why did you put me here? Cowardly mindset. His soul knows only one fear, that cowardly vulgarity which is sin. He hates mediocrity. He hates to do things by halves. You should hate to just be fence straddling. You should be energetically 
on fire to live supernaturally, to live all in for our Lord. Look how excited someone is that's going to be training for the Olympics, for example, who, or if you've met entrepreneurs, like they got these ideas, they got this energy, they got this flow. We should have that about the faith. This dynamism, that's what we need. We need this, this renewal, this reformation of Catholics that has this dynamism and energy and fight. He shuns all pessimists who see only the difficulties of everything. You have to be able to see through these difficulties in the church. That's why I'm trying to bring this the Soka perspective, taking that principle and applying it to the sense, okay, regardless of what happens here, what happens here, the answer to this question, that question about the Pope's authority, the questions about what might happen if things were abrogated or whatever. Not that I'm saying they were, but let's say it's the worst case scenario. The Christian outlook is not defeatism. It's to bear that cross and to go down fighting. And he is not afraid to live as a Christian in the world among other men. We have so many, say, within the church and without that don't have faith, or they, they claim to be in the church. We Don't be afraid of them. They're going to discourage you implicitly by their indifference or explicitly by their hatred of the cross. Disdain for it. By their attachment to comfortable living. For the status quo. You can't be satisfied with the status quo in your own life or elsewhere. Learn about the life of um, Blessed uh, Charles d'Autriche, Charles of Austria, the like, last of the princes in the Austrian line. He basically died in a way that you would think sounds almost like, man, he was defeated. But he died fighting for something. And his sainthood, his legacy lives on. And he was, he, I mean, he, had, he did heroic things. Just look it up, you know, flying undercover and stuff like that. Um, from what I hear, it, just, just heroic. I mean, he's going to be called a saint soon. You know, there, there was, a, I believe, a Jesuit, I think is a saint, who went to like an island, I can't remember where. And he tried converting these people for years and years and years and then like got on a ship and left dejected or something and died on that ship. And then within like 10 or 20 years, everyone on that, on that island, because of his influence, eventually converted. And that's sort of the beauty of the cross is like God brings the resurrection through the cross this, to, to such the, the astonishment of the apostles, Right. And that shows the pre- and post-conversion. Like now I can see, we're called to see with faith beyond the apparent death that we're facing. The tragic yet heroic and beautiful death that we can offer in this fight. You know, when you watch these movies, heroic movies, inspirational movies, what is it about them? It's that there's something good worth fighting for. Even if I die, we'll not lose our spirit, even if we're defeated here. And then you're victorious either way. He goes on, The true Christian is very happy to live in this age because he sees how much there is to be done. It pains him to see the sadness of men who do not love one another, who invent new forms of martyrdom for one another. He sees that the church is persecuted, that his brothers are exhausted. He wants to defend them and never thinks of martyrdom. He is young and has no wish to let himself be killed. If he must die in the fight someday, he is determined to die fighting. So it's not that he doesn't want to be a martyr. You know, we should desire that to be able to offer that to our Lord, but it's that we want to be able to fight. If I'm martyr, it's, I'm going to be martyred in the process of fighting. And I'm not talking physically here. I'm talking culturally, societally, within the church. And I, I'm convinced that it begins with our own formation and forming those that we can around us. Because an army of a thousand leaders is going to be far more influential than a hundred thousand Catholics that are kind of, you know, either, you know, one's really big on family life, one's really big on liturgy, 
But if none of them have the interior at the heart of it, it's just not going to bear long-term fruit. That I, I know that's that's Kevin's opinion. I'm basing that on Father Gary Lagrange. I'm basing that on the Soli Apostolate theology, sanctifying grace at the heart of all this. But yeah, that's my opinion. We need to begin with formation, and we should learn all these other things. But the interior life has to be the heart of it, and the, the interior life impels c- compels you to 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 get formation in all these other areas too. By the way. Because grace perfects nature and in that interior life, you're disposed to grace working in your soul, operating in your soul. And then you're like, I want to cooperate with that. And that entails holistic growth as a human and in the faith in all the areas. <clears throat> if he must die in the fight someday, he is determined to die fighting. He thinks it is too easy to become a hero in a moment. He wishes to feel deeply the heroism of living every day, day after day, Christ. There is the heroism we get to live right now. You know, it's really, really hard to be disciplined with technology today, bombarding us with the vanity of social media, with all of the ideologies and temptations to lust, with really the dissipation and distraction of so many things going on. We're always going to stuff. So little stability. Lack of family life. Lack of maturity. We're just bombarded. And yet we're also, it's so easy to just use opiates, so to speak, to numb ourselves to the realities of things. If you can fight through that, you will find a crown of, a glorious crown waiting for you in heaven. And Saints Peter and Paul, John, Saint Joseph, a blessed mother, they will be waiting to commend you. This, I think, is the real perspective we need to be taking right now. When we see these difficulties, do we just say, it's all their fault? We become dejected. Or do we embrace the fight? <clears throat> this is the great truth. For you and for me, battles or hardships, praise or mockery, contempt or laughter have no importance. The night of the world is passing fast. Day is drawing near. We repeat with words of Pope Pius XII, quote, The gravity of the hour can disturb or affect only the lukewarm and the hesitant. For burning and generous souls accustomed to live in Christ and with Christ, that very gravity, on the contrary, is a powerful stimulus to overcome and extinguish it. That is the lukewarm. End quote. People might laugh at us. From both sides. Let's say you're someone who's like, yeah, I get the, the liturgical, like liturgy is so important, but we still have the interior life and that's so critical and and we've got to have peace in our souls, right? So we can't just like, all we do, all we talk about, all we think about is what's wrong. So people are going to be like, how dare you? You don't understand how important this is. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'll, I'll be quoting stuff from St. Teresa of Avila and other posts, but she just wanted to talk about spiritual life, supernatural goods. Other conversation would exhaust her a lot of the time. A lot of saints are like that. And so if we want to be super trad, super traditional, the saints are the super trads. Okay, <laughs> let's be super trad. That's where we're aiming to be. Super trad like the saints. Saint trad. And they're not going to be disturbed by the mockery or contempt or laughter that people may pose to them for saying, this is what I'm going to live like in the world today. I'm going to have this mission. You're never going to win. Great. Thanks for that. I'm going to keep going. I don't care what you say. 
certain silent determination. The night of the world is passing fast, day is drawing near. We know that this life is just a little blimp. What are we doing with our time? The gravity of the hour can disturb or affect only the lukewarm and hesitant. So we're getting at. We can't, we have to, we, the new formation, new standard formation that is not lukewarm, that isn't hesitant. That's, that's, that's it. It's like, uh, I don't know if we really should be yelling or not. I don't know. Like, and that's part of the problem that some people get caught up with. You know, that's temptation for me. Caught up with these questions of like, what's this or what's that? And then, oh, I found the answer. And then, oh, no, I didn't. And I I, I, it can draw our will out of a sense of conviction of being able to really decide, clamp down on something that is actually within our power. To be resolved to something. If we're just hesitant, we have to say, I'm going to be all in. And the only way I can really feel like I'm all in is if my main focus is on, is on what is in my sphere of influence? For burning and generous souls accustomed to live in Christ and with Christ, that very gravity, on the contrary, is a powerful stimulus to overcome and distinguish it. I'm pumped up because we have such an opportunity to redeem the times. It's freaking awesome. Do you want to be a part of this movement to redeem the times, brothers? Take the means necessary. If you're going to be a soldier in a war, you got to gear up. You got to get formed. You got to go through boot camp and training. You need brothers with you. You're not a secret agent. You're a soldier in an army. Find your army. Have an apostolic end, an ideal. Why should we fear it? The this period of transition towards a new age of fire, which brings with it such terrible birth pains, is our age. Why not love it? Turn your eyes toward Christ. Ask him to open them for you. Then you will understand, and you will become enthusiastic about the adventures that we will discuss. The adventure of a generous life. The adventure of hard work. The adventure of sorrow. The adventure of failure. The adventure of death. It is truly an adventure we get to live. And it may take a little imagination to see that, but I would say it really it takes faith. Do you believe we're on the brink right now? Like, if I died, and I heard of someone who, like, there was a bee or something stung in the wrong place and just died on the spot like that. You don't know when the time is coming. There's just a small, it's just like a veil right here. You die, and it's either... You're going to one or two places. Finality. Either you're going to hell or you're going to heaven or purgatory. Eventually heaven. That's it. It is binary. Ultimately, reality for us individually is binary. But not only that, there's a glory that awaits us. I just want to end with what St. Teresa of Avila said. She's talking about you know, her desire for glory and having seen the favors of God in visions and, and things like that. She's seen the, the difference in, in favors in this life and favors in the next, meaning the enjoyment of God that comes from preparing and disposing ourselves for that glory, for that charity. She said, since the time the Lord showed me how great the difference is in heaven between the joy of some and the joy of others, I have seen clearly that also here on earth the Lord has no measure in giving when he is pleased to do so. Thus, I wouldn't want to use any measure in my service of his majesty and in employing all my life and strength and health to this end. I wouldn't want to lose through my own fault as much as one tiny particle of greater glory. One tiny particle of greater glory. You feel that in your soul? That should 
hit real hard. The Lord showed me how great the difference is in heaven between the joy of some and the joy of others. What causes the difference here? I wouldn't want to lose through my own fault as much as one tiny particle of greater glory. That's how much each particle of glory makes a difference in the joy in heaven. Think of it like the opportunities, all the stories you get to tell, all those, all those times you had this, this fight. And the fight often happens when you're alone. Or at least alone in your soul. There's little decisions. The battle with your imagination. The battle to follow through on your resolutions. The battle to make a plan. To face yourself. To not go into the opiates. The comforts. To follow that inspiration, to be generous, to do that penance, to do the hard work, to fight through the sorrow, to face doubts. This is the adventure of the Christian life. And there is glory that awaits us at the end. So when we consider the state of the church, when we consider what's going on, maybe it's the end of the world. I don't know. But I am happy. I'm enthusiastic to be alive right now. Because I get to help redeem the times. I get to cooperate with God's grace and his amazing creative work of redemption and sanctification and glorification. I get to play a part in that right now. Let's get after it.